Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our All Partner CPN virtual dining event here at Joe's Butcher Shop in downtown Carmel with our host this evening, head chef Jason Cornelius. Before we get started, I'd like to just take a moment and thank Jason and Joe Lazare and his wonderful team here at Joe's Butcher Shop for helping support this really unique event. You know, Jason, one of the strategies that we've used in our well-being program has been really to focus on providing opportunities for our providers to have some collegial and social events. Unfortunately, the practice of medicine can be a lonely job sometimes. And that sense of isolation can lead to uh, an effect on your well-being, and we've seen evidence that it can increase the risk of burnout amongst our physicians and other providers. And with the advent of COVID-19, we've had to cancel all of our in-person social events. And so we thought, um, since preparing and sharing meals really symbolizes friendship and hospitality, that this would be a great event for us to be able to help reconnect in a safe and entertaining way. So we really appreciate um, all your support in this event this oh, evening. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you as well, uh, community uh, network providers, for uh, giving us this opportunity to actually play around a little bit and be a little bit excited and creative uh, to get away from the everyday normal routine of what we do. It really helps us release all of that energy. So uh, with that being said, I'd just like to thank you again. And we love having you here. It's great. Well, are we ready to get started? Yeah, let's get cooking. Okay, let's I'll get start cooking. washing my hands. <laughs> awesome. I'm gonna let Chef Brittany actually stop in here and okay. help us out a little bit with the prep today. All right. Squash. Trash. So, Brittany, if you'd like to step on over here. Before we get started, we do have a couple of really exciting courses that we're going to do. We need to get our longtime cookers in the oven first. So everything that I've based today is going to be at the same temperature in the oven at 350 degrees. So we won't have any time to mess around with the fluctuation of the temperature change in the oven. So first, what I'd like you to do is just to go ahead and get your sweet potatoes washed up and we can get those into the oven, and get them baked off right away. While I'm doing that, I'm gonna have Brittany here. She's going to break down some of our butternut squash that we're gonna utilize for our spinach green salad for the fall. She's making it look a little easy, isn't she? I was gonna say. <laughs> That doesn't look like a very sophisticated <laughs> tool. I thought you guys had more sophisticated cut tools. Believe it or not, the, the speedy peeler that you can find at your yeah, local Walmart grocery version. store is the best version <laughs> oh, that you yeah, can have. Absolutely. It's the intricate ones efficient. that look like a hook that are a little bit yeah. harder to use. Yeah. The speedy peeler really gets the job so done really nice. Any, uh, local Walmart grocery, or you get a Sur La Tire, or any yeah. kitchen store realistically. Yeah, it makes it cool. Next to you. Those. Okay. Wow. We got a first aid kit handy here. Uh. <laughs> that's a sharp knife, too. So. <laughs> not my usual. Nip that tip off so we don't flip like I just did. Go after the middle. Oh, the fun part, this is usually what I make my kids do, is oh, to take all the seeds, yeah. but just get you a spoon a and they'll just scoop right out of there. Spoon. Just like that. They like doing all the gross and grimy. <laughs> oh, Halloween's coming, so they can get some practice, they right? Get a little bit out of the way, right? So now that Brittany is breaking down those butternut squash, we've got our sweet potatoes all washed up. You can go ahead and throw those in the oven at a pre-temp 350 degrees. They'll need to bake for about an hour and 15 minutes. There you go. Now, Jason, what type of salt do you, how do you decide what type of salt you use for seasoning? different types of dishes. I mean, there's all types I, I, of salt that's available. I, I think that there's one common rule that I'm going to use. If I'm going to cook, I'm going to use a kosher salt. Something flaker, it's gonna dissolve a little bit easier. It's got a little bit heavier note to it as well. If I'm baking, doing something like cakes, I want something a little bit more granular that's gonna bake down and break apart quickly, right? It's not gonna be clumping up okay. or anything of that line. So if I'm cooking, I tend to use just the kosher salt. Uh, a, a normal flake is fine. You can use a granulated table salt is perfectly fine. You'll tend to over salt a little bit if you go for a granulated salt because you're grabbing at a bigger pinch as well. I so see. with the flake, you get a, a little bit more of an idea of how much you're putting in there. It's got a little bit more volume to it. You can see it. I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Another question I have for you, how well are the uh, ovens that most people have at home in terms of regulating temperature? 
you know, I, I think with, with uh, technology the way it is today, they kind of keep up realistically what they're going to get with the commercial kitchen oven. Uh, most are gonna have a conventional oven that's not pumping hot air. You're not gonna lose much difference in time from what we're cooking here today. You're probably going to only need to add another five or six minutes. It's okay. not going to take much longer. Um, in the degree of temperature that you're cooking at will not change at all yeah, either. Make that much right. difference. Right. Exactly. All right. Throw some oil, salt, pepper in your bowl, toss it. Oven. Right in the oven. So we're gonna to toss this. After we toss in a little bit of olive oil, salt, and just a little bit of pepper, you put it on a sheet pan lined with parchment paper. You can toss that in your oven at 350 degrees, and it's only gonna need 20 minutes. Now, like the doctor said, with a convention oven, if you are using a conventional oven, it, I would say tops maybe 25 minutes. If it's not as tender as you would like it, you could always just finish it off a little bit in the saute pan. It is going to go uh, in, in a tossed salad, so a little bit of texture will be nice with that as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brittany. You want to throw that in the oven? Let's get real wild now. <laughs> So while Brittany has those going in the oven, we are going to go ahead and prepare the candied spice nuts, which these things, uh, uh, they're so addicting. I'm telling you that I can literally just munch on them all day long and not have a worry about anything in the, in the world. So what I've got here is just roughly about two and a half cups of my pecans, a little bit of spice of cinnamon just to help it give that nice kick, regular sugar and light brown sugar. The trick to get it to stick to the nuts, though, is a little bit of egg white. So I'm going to take this here. Break that open. And just separate it out. Don't need the yolk. I am going to need that hand washing <laughs> sink there right behind you now, though. So if I could just grab this uh -huh. whisk here from you here. Sure. We're going to give this a really whisk. Would you like to go at sure, this Sure, I'll go at So what, really, what we need to do is a soft peak. Okay. So it's going to turn frothy on you. It's not going to stand. The people still try to fall. That is a soft peak when it, it gets a little ribbon in it. Okay. It'll deflate itself. That's what we're looking for. That's going to be our binder that we use to get all the spices in onto the nuts onto the nuts. That is correct. Okay. Oh, you're going to have to give me more than that, dog. All right. <laughs> you're going to have to give me more than that. There you go. Keep going. Good. Okay? It's a muscle workout for All sure. Right. A little bit further. You little still have a little bit of egg white down okay. the bottom. You can still kind of see how it's collecting down there. Very nice. That's good. So once you see how, when you make that ribbon, uh -huh. there's still a little bit of clear liquid underneath. So that you just need to go, go away, a little huh? bit further and you're ready okay. to go. So when that ribbon goes away, That's you right. know you're done. Huh? That's right. Now, this is a dish that you can use with a lot of different uh, foods, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, you can use these to accent salads and all kinds Right, of absolutely. You can make uh, all, all kinds of different nuts. You could use almonds and pralines to do uh, cashews, anything. You can adjust your spice level with cayennes. You yeah. turn your bowl this way here a little bit. There we go. And a nice snack for the holidays, too, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nice healthy snack. A little dried <laughs> fruit on the side of it and maybe some chocolate bits in there if you're feeling a little bit of a sweet tooth that looks great there so if you just okay. take that okay we're going to toss this right on top of the pecans here take our sugars right on top don't worry about that that's just clumped in now if i could grab that box of gloves behind you sir yep So Jason, how did you get started in the culinary field? Uh, you know, just by luck, really, and falling in with uh, falling in love with food at, a, at an early age. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I, you know, I was born and uh, raised in Southern Indiana. I, I grew up on a farm with a family of farmers, a uh, fruit farm, actually, uh, down in just Southern Indiana. That kind of, I think, just started the whole 
ball rolling, if you will, right? Because you're not only seeing all the family gather around the dinner table, but you're helping out grandma in the, in the kitchen, you're helping out your aunts and your uncles. Uh, after I graduated high school, I, I was already working in the kitchen and decided that maybe I should try cooking and I fell in love right away. I've been in country clubs for uh, maybe the past 10 or 11 years, uh, the very beginning of my career uh, until uh, I, I went downtown for a little while and worked in a little high volume Italian business, which uh, gave me the aspect of just volume, 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 volume. It's all a repetition of practice. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I fell in love with food at a really, really young age. And then as I grew a little bit older, I started to respect the fact and then enjoy teaching others how to cook, enjoyed feeding people and seeing how happy they were that their stomach stuffed and <laughs> it, it, it just became addicting. It really, it really did. So I pursued it right away. I just had to, I had to get into it. I had to learn more. I had to work in different types of cuisine. I, I needed to know it all. Had to. Wonderful. Had to. So now we've got our nuts. We've got them all mixed up. All of our sugar and everything is all sticking to it. We'll just need a sheet pan. You can use a parchment paper. I'm going to be using what's called a silpat. Can you grab that right there? Thank you very much, sir. This is going to do the same thing that your parchment paper will do. This is a silpat. You can get this at your grocery store. So this is a very high heat resident resin. You can put anything on here and it will not stick. Straight sugar and caramelize it down in the, in the oven and nothing is going to stick to it. Parchment paper is still going to do the same thing. You're just going to want to get it off of your sheet pan as it's a little bit warmer so it's not sticking to the paper. So we'll just toss this right on here. The, really the only important part of our candy nuts is paying attention to why they're in the oven. They're going to go into a 350 degree oven for 20 minutes, but you have to stir them every five minutes so that the caramel is not collecting in one spot and burning on the sheet pan. The, the, a little dark, not and a, and a, and so a over roasted nut becomes a little bit better. So you have to be a little bit visual and in what you're going. Now we've got two of the three components ready to go for our salad. We are squashes in the oven, roasting down. We've already made our candy nuts and put those in the oven. We just need to throw together our orange rosemary vinaigrette to top our salad. Really simple. A lot of people seem really nervous when it makes vinaigrette because it is emulsification and it breaks and it separates and it's not aesthetically pleasing, you kind of feel let down. This is fail safe. It's, it's not going to break. You can toss it all into a blender. You can toss it all into a mixing bowl, which we're going to do now. So we'll take our orange, we'll cut that there. Okay, so we'll just take our orange, give it a nice squeeze right into the bowl. You can do this with orange juice as well. I prefer an orange. I think it's a lot sweeter uh -huh. than the orange juice itself. And with all the pulp and everything, you still kind of want to strain it out. And fresher. And fresher, for yeah. sure. Definitely has a much more pungent orange than the juice itself. So now that we've got our orange in there, I've just got a little bit of paprika here. It's a smoked paprika. And I'm going to toss all of my ingredients all in. Does it all, make any all, difference all, in what all, order you put them all in? All at once. No, okay. no, it doesn't. Not at all. All at once. So that was just a touch of salt. This is a touch of ground mustard, right? A little vinegar to help the acidity of, acidity of the orange there. We need that acidity there to help bind the oil to make our vinaigrette. You just give that a little whisk. Oh, that smells great. It smells really good, doesn't it? We're gonna let that bloom just a little bit because we are using a little bit of a dry ingredient. That's gonna bloom if you will, in the liquid, and it's going to start to be more aromatic and then release more of its its flavor, right? Oh, it smells delicious. This here, get my orange. So we just threw everything in there. We've got our quarter cup of oil that we're gonna do. If you would like to, you can lift the back end of that bowl just up a little okay. bit so they could see it. So just a little stream, and that's gonna work all right in. All 
right. Let's see that for a second. Thank you very much. The fun part, right? This is great. Would you like to try it? Sure. Thank very you. smoky, very sweet. Great compliment to our sweet squash, our sweet candied pecans that we have. Delicious. Wonderful, Delicious. wonderful. Most importantly, we may need to preheat our pans before we add our oil. If you add your oil in with the pan while it's heating up, you're gonna burn your oil. It's gonna become bitter. Okay. Don't, you, okay. Do, you don't want that at all, especially with an extra virgin olive oil or even butter at that matter. Once that butter starts to break down and starts to brown and all the milk fats in it will start to burn it becomes bitter as well. So we want to preheat our pan. What we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and flash off our prosciutto crisps for our salad. So we just need a little bit of oil. Now that the heat is on, we're on a high flame. We just need a touch of oil because there's really just enough fat in the prosciutto to help it cook down on its own. We just need to help get it started a little bit. Oh my Lord. Yeah, so just give that a little swirl around. Once it's heated up, you can literally just place in. It's just gonna fry up just like bacon. Let it get that sizzle. Once we flip it over, we can just turn off the heat. The residual heat out of the pan will render down that fat and crisp up a little bit of that prosciutto for us, just the way we want it to go. But as you can see, I've already started another pan here uh -huh. too. You let the guy go just for like a minute, not even 60 seconds or so. See how you're starting to get that yeah. brown on the side. That's what we're looking for. We want that we look to be, we want the edges to brown up yeah. almost all the way around before we flip that. Okay. We know it's ready to it's go. Ready to it's ready to go up. And that same thing works with <laughs> most proteins, actually. That's if you're frying off fish, if you're hitting off a steak, uh, minus reverse searing because then you're doing it at a colder temperature and you're wanting just to seal up all the sides at once. But you're wanting to look for that pellicle. The pellicle is the skin that the, that the protein is correcting on the edges of it. So now we've got that. Just like I said, just a couple of minutes. It's going to brown up real nice. We can just let the residual heat pretty much take the rest of that all the way out. So we just kill the flame. Is that just medium heat that you have it on? Jay? I had it all the way up, all as, high, as high as she went, okay. as high as she goes. But like I said, the residual heat will finish off that prosciutto. We could just set it aside. You can set it out on, once it's cooled down in the pan, maybe we've got it out on some paper towel to help dry out some of that fat. Right. That's gonna help crisp it a little bit more. You can save that fat off too. We can use it in any type of vegetable cooking or any mashed potatoes sure. or even even if that, if that matter. So we've got that, we can just set that aside and set that on some paper towel. Let that cool down and crunch it right up, go right on the salad. And Jason, how did you prepare the prosciutto? The prosciutto, well, we've done in pan. So we'll do that in a nonstick skillet. Okay. Just on a nice medium flame, render it down a little bit of the fat itself, uh, flip it over just a couple minutes. It doesn't take very long at all. Let's see. So we'll just give a nice little rough cut here. The prosciutto is going to provide a really nice salt side to that sweet that we're using with the vinaigrette and the butternut squash and the candy pecans. Candy pecans. With you. So now that we have our autumn squash out of the oven, our candy pecans are all done, looking wonderful. We've got all of our ingredients here to make our fall salad. Just a little bit of baby spinach here. Let's hop crisps. I like to give those a little crunch if you'd love to. You're oh. more than welcome to okay. cut just a couple chops in there just to help them break them up. Beautiful. Awesome. There you go. our dressing here. Looks beautiful, Jason. Thank you. And there you have it. 
baby spinach fall salad with a nice cayenne candy pepper pecan, dried crane raisins, and an oven roasted butternut squash finished off with an orange rosemary vinaigrette. Wonderful. All right, so we've got our dinner salad out of the way. We can move right into our vegetarian dish. Now we've had our sweet potatoes in the oven for about a half an hour, 40 minutes or so. It only takes about an hour and 15 minutes. So it'll give us plenty of time to mise the rest of our product. When I say mise, it is a loose term. Mise and pasta is a French term actually for everything in its place. So without all of our ingredients here in front of us or where we need them, we are kind of blinded and maybe forget some of the things that need to go into the dish. So it's important to have everything in its place ready to go. So like that, let's digress back. Our sweet potato has been in the oven now for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. We can go ahead and start breaking down our parsnips and get our chickpeas going for our curry chickpea stuffing. So I can squeeze by you here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off with our garbanzo beans or our chickpeas. And we have them, just a small can. That's all you really need. But the most important thing I think now is saving the aquafaba. That is the bean water that is in the can for the beans. It's preserving the beans. Now this is a wonderful substitute, vegan substitute, vegetarian substitute that you can use for egg whites. So you can save all of that aquafaba, use it for meringues, chocolate mousses, you can bake it in cakes. Like I said, it's a wonderful vegan substitute for eggs. It has a wonderful hold to it if you're going to whisk it into a meringue or a mousse. It, it's, it has wonderful purposes for it. So I'd never get rid of our bean water. We're always using that for something else. Is Const that unique to this particular bean that you use? I Absolutely mean, not. You can use I, it with any, any bean water. I mean, I, I would probably stay away from more of your green beans or okay. your peas, but most beans, your, your great northerns, your whites, your cannellinis, uh, even red beans, black beans, all, all of are going to have that all of them are going to have that aquafaba in there that you're going to want to I use. See. Absolutely. Let me grab a bowl here. I'm going to give you the fork. All right. So now what we're going to build, we've cleared off all of our aquafaba. Just let that set off to the side and dry off a little bit. That doesn't have to be completely dry because we're going to saute it down with butter anyway. But we can optionally build our own curry here. Wow. So I've got all of our ingredients laid down. This is just a little bit of ground ginger. So you're making your own curry. My own curry, correct. Right. I'd much rather do my own curry because I can, then I can know that how hot it's going to be or how sweet I would like it. Uh, it takes a little bit of repetition and a couple times to do it to get it just that level of where you're like, okay, so if I'm going to substitute cayenne pepper, if I want it spicy tonight, mm -hmm. I could throw a little bit more cayenne in there. Or I'm entertaining guests. I want it a little bit sweeter. Just a little brown sugar is going to help that yeah. go a long way. So I've got my ground ginger ground turmeric, it's a little bit of salt. This is coriander here. Get these beans out of the way. A little fresh ground cumin. There's that hot part. Here's the cayenne. We're going with this oh, a little bit spicier because we okay. have a little bit of sweetness out of that sweet potato. Jason, what's the shelf life for spices? I mean, I know we have spices in our kitchen that we probably rarely use. What, what's a good rule of thumb in terms of? I'm a big believer in getting whole spices. If you were able to get a hold of, let's say whole peppercorns or whole cumin seed or cardamom, anything along that line, that as a whole is best because then you can grind it. It's as going to, it. It, it's as you need it. It stays fresher, longer. Now, uh, to answer your question, Typically, if it's in an airtight uh, container, uh, I would say a couple months, it's going to lose a lot of potency really quick, especially if air is able to get to it. The more you're opening it and using it and more and putting it back, it, see clumping and, it starts yeah. clumping, yeah. gets, gets right. a little humidity in there. Uh, so like I said, I like to have things whole. You can grind it down. It's a little bit more of a work. Uh, to do in the kitchen, but it, it's worth it in the end. And Sounds like it's more economical too. You're not throwing out Wasted agreed, yeah. agreed. So we've got all of our dry spices here to make our curry in, in a large bowl here. And Doc, if you'd like to give that a nice little whisk okay. up together. Awesome. Oh, wow, the doctor's busy at work now. I'm gonna go ahead and peel down my parsnips. 
So Jason, tell us, what are the common mistakes that home cooks make? If you had to narrow it down to sort of your, maybe your top five or 10 things that most of us amateurs really don't understand about. Well, I think number one rule, like I said just before, is your mise en place. Is having everything that you need right there. Because there's nothing more distracting in the kitchen than having to walk away from the pantry and get something else. Oh, what did I get? I can't remember. What did I need? Oh, I go back to your pot or go back to your skillet and start cooking again. Uh, I, I think that that's the number one rule. It's having everything that you need right then and there really helps get the job done a little bit more proficient. You feel a little bit more accomplished too because it's coming together so easily and, and you're having so much fun doing it. Uh, another mistake I think that some have in the kitchen, I wouldn't say that most, is playing with their food. <laughs> And I can explain this again too. When when we move over to start actually uh, heating and sauteing a little bit of these vegetables up to go into our, our potatoes, it's usually a pretty big rule breaker. Uh, touching the pan too much or stirring around the sauce too much, you gotta let it, the pan do its job. It, it's, it's, it's doing its job, it's cooking. It needs to bloom all together. I, I really think that's it. It's just attention to the detail. Knowing that you have everything there that you need is half the battle really planning ahead it's really yeah. it is it's yeah. it's it's half the battle because the heat's going to do the rest of the job the pan's going to do it as long as we have all of our ingredients and we're following it in a procedural way it's going to it's going to be delicious every single time right wonderful thank you very much doc for that curry so now that we have our parsons peeled down for the harissa we just want to take off the top and the ends just to kind of clean them up a little bit just to kind of clean them up a what we're going to do is cut an actual oblique, an oblique cut, half of a triangle cylinder. I'm turning my knife this way and cutting it on a 45 degree angle and coming back and straight across. So we're getting these lovely. Oh, I see. Aesthetically pleasing. Provides us a little bit more texture too in our dish. You can do that with the scalpel, right? Uh, hey, no, no, <laughs> they took those sharp things away from me. That's, that's why I became an internist. <laughs> it's definitely one of the better parts of my job. I get to play with uh, sharp things and fire all day and create wonderful dishes. Well, we've got that. We're ready to go there. I don't think I need this big guy here. Take these and bowl them up. Now, so I do have one saved here. I did kind of cheat, if you will. I did not bring my own harissa. I oh, okay. bought harissa seasoning. My harissa seasoning is a combination of dried peppers. You can range from anything from a chipotle pepper to cayenne. Uh, there's wonderful Mideastern smokier uh, uh, So it can be any peppers. Variety. If there's not necessarily not necessarily no, a specific not ne not a specific type of pepper it can be as sweet as you would want it maybe as a roasted red bell pepper to as hot as you want it as a ghost chili pepper it's a base of peppers cumin coriander a little bit of salt and pepper and that's harissa season the technically what you would do with your harissa is either combine it with a little bit of water or a little bit of oil to almost make like a paste like a marinade but we'll do that in pan with our oil as we cook our parsnips for the stuffed potato dish. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, we go one more. We'll go ahead and slice down our mushrooms as well, and then we can move and start cooking. And now we've got our button mushrooms as well. You're going to want to give these a slight wash, just a little bit of warm water to help rinse off some of that dirt and get some of the dirt that, from when it's growing in out of there. We don't want to eat that. It's pretty flavorless, right? <laughs> So just, like I said, there's a little bit of warm water because the warm is actually going to evaporate. The water is going to evaporate quicker than the cold water. We don't really want it to set into the fungus because the fungus itself will actually start to become soft because I it see. is by any means a fungus. It is a bacteria, correct? So any more so life you're giving to it, it starts to think it's growing again. And it's so you really want to use warm water, right? For those warm water. It's just going to, and it's going to dry up really quick too. So we just take those after they've been rinsed off quickly. We'll give them a quick slice. Pick a couple out here. I'm pushing my gloves up. You have to watch your fingers <laughs> yeah. on, on this one. I'm not ready to nip anything out. So just a nice slice down here.
Are you a fan of the mushrooms? Oh, I love mushrooms. All varieties. All varieties. And you're an Indiana man, so yeah. you love your morels and yep. your chestnuts. Right. And I'm a very big fan of mushrooms myself. I'm really, it's really odd. I'm very finicky. I don't eat mushrooms that other people cook. Is that weird? Really? There's a lot of things here you that have a I phobia that, about that. There's a lot of things that I <laughs> won't eat the, that the I won't eat that someone else cook. I, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. I don't. I Maybe mean, I think that's just me. I don't know. Any There's particular a few reason things. you pick this particular mushroom for this dish, or? No, not really. Not to really. be honest with you, I love a button mushroom. It's nice and nutty. It's earthy. Simple. It's not overpowering like you're going to get with a, a portobello or a chestnut mushroom or a morel. Uh, it's a little late in the season now, but it's a little bit more mild. It still has that meat to it, though, that textural meat, like a, a, a cap, what, a portobello cap or a shiitake. Just not as overpowering. Because really, this, the, the shining part of this dish really is the curry garbanzo curry. beans and the parsnips, the sweet potato itself. The, the potato or the mushroom just gives it that nicer, earthier taste to it. Wonderful. And we're going to hop right into our stuffed baked sweet potato. So just like I said before, we're gonna preheat our pan. Now this is also on high. This is also all the way up on high. Okay. We're gonna start with the longest cooking item of them all. So we wanna start longest to shortest so that way everything arrives together on the same time. We'll melt this butter down just a little bit. We'll let it burn, we're just melting it down. Go ahead and throw our parsnips in there. You see how that's set in there now a little bit. Those milk fats have all separated and started to brown up. Sure. That's what I was speaking of by letting your pan start with that. Steady. It would have been like that before we put it in. It's going to be burning by now. We don't, we don't want that. You're going to get that. that bitter. Right. So we just let those saute for a quick little bit and a little bit of butter. They just need to sit for maybe two minutes tops. We'll give them a nice shake and then spice them with our harissa. The harissa will bloom in the rest of that fat, just like it's making our paste or our marinade. Oh, I see. Oh, could you use that fava extract from the beans for this as well, instead of butter or not? For, for cooking, do uh, you use that to, to prepare vegetables? I'm sure you can. I, there's not going to be much flavor to it. It's really more of a binding, realistically, than it is like a lubricant or a cooking liquid that you're going to use. Uh, if you're a vegan or if a vegetarian, you could go, always go for an extra virgin olive oil or an olive, a table olive oil itself. So, uh, you just need minimal amounts. I maybe put uh, a tablespoon and a half of butter in there. If I was using oil, it probably wouldn't have been a teaspoon or two teaspoons. I wouldn't need much at all. So now that we're getting a little bit of color on our parsnips, we're going to go ahead and harissa them. This is our ground peppers, cumins, coriander, salt, pepper, a little spicy. Just about a tablespoon on there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see how it coats that. So space saving, we're going to use the same pan to make all the ingredients. Oh, wow. Now that the parsnips have been in and they flipped, you can give them a couple tosses in the seasoning. Push them back to the back side of the pan. Take your chickpeas. A little bit of your curry. Knob some butter in there just for the mushrooms. Arugula, arugula. And salt and pepper. S&P is the choice for me. <laughs> that's, that's how I say it here. A little bit of salt and pepper all over the whole thing. I'll let that saute down a little bit. Well, the mushrooms start to saute, once those are good to go, we can toss in our arugula. So really, the mushrooms are going to soak up a lot of the liquid and the flavor out of the pan because they're very porous, they're very spongy. Throw a little 
baby arugula in there. I chose baby because I think it's a little bit more peppery and mustardy than a full grown as well. It gives a nice green texture. Nice. Also colorful dish too. Very colorful. Very colorful dish. So there we have it. There's our stuffing was prepared for our baked sweet potato. You just set it aside. As soon as your baked potato comes out, we can split it. What we're gonna do with our baked potato, we'll show you back up front. Okay. And then you've had your sweet potatoes out of the oven. You just need to take them and cut them in half. We're gonna take some of those lovely insides. Just give them a couple pulls out of there. And put it right in with our ragu. Same thing here. This dish is absolutely delicious vegetarian dish. Uh, you, you can easily make it completely vegan by doing all the oil burns, uh, no butter substitutes or anything like that. Super simple. We'll just take this here, dump it right back in. Oh wow. Looks incredible. Not so bad. So there you have it. Nice little spiced parsnips. That curry is going to create a little bit of heat. Really sweet. Uh, works really well with the sweet potato. This is great for warming back up and leftovers. You can keep all of your toppings if you have leftovers and top them back into a salad or have them as a side dish with your sea bass. Um, it, it's a wonderful thing and, and I encourage you please to try it. Okay. Looks great. There's some forks behind you here. Perfect. Mm. That's outstanding. What do you think? It's good. Not too spicy. No. Not at all. That's the abilities of, of being able to work your own curry. It's a huge advantage if, if you're making it yourself. You can know where that heat level is at. Right. If, if I, I'm not saying they saying don't go buy it on your own, you have more control over it if you make it yourself. Delicious. Yeah. Wonderful. Delicious, yeah. Wonderful. So now we're going to go ahead and work out our sea bass here. So the sea bass I've taken out of the refrigerator. I'd like it to sit out for at least five to 10 minutes and come up in temperature a little bit for room temperature that I just need my, my sear to be really fast and really close so I can sear all that off really quick. So I've got my pan preheating and then this is going to be uncomfortably hot. And I, when I say uncomfortably hot, you can see smoke is starting to riddle is, off the top of it, there, right? I mean, how long do you usually let your pan preheat? Is there a way to tell that it's ready to go by just how you- how You can works? literally almost see smoke coming off oh, okay. of it. You see that? I see. So I don't you know if you can catch that. Can you off? catch that on camera? So you so, know it's ready. I know that it's ready. I'm going to okay. actually pull that off the heat just a touch. A little bit of oil. Okay. You know, for each spot. So here's what I was talking about. You were asking about some of the mistakes that cooks make at home. It's playing with your food. So realistically, once our pan is hot and our oil is in it, we don't want to touch our fish. We want the pan to do its own job, right? I'm going to flip these over. I'm going to give them a little salt and pepper. Can you give us some pointers, Jason, a little bit about selecting and buying fish? Uh, there seems to be some concern about mislabeling and really getting what you think you're buying at the store. And how do you how do you identify good quality fresh fish? I, I think number one rule is skin on. You're not wanting to see something that's already broken down, already filleted. Uh, skin on, color of the fish. You don't want it to be pale. It's just like flesh. Once it's been processed, it will lose all of its color. It will bleed out all of its albumin. That is, albumin is the blood that is in the fish itself. So I think that the number one key is the color. Number one key, if you're, getting, if you're going for salmon in this bright, wonderful orange sunset, dark ruby reds, 
That is the key one. You're not wanting to go something that is starting to be pale and pink or flesh colored looking because it's been sitting there, it's oxidized, or it could have been sitting under ice or water. Now, believe it or not, you can drown a dead fish. You literally, if you have a pan of fish at home that's sitting with water in it, and have you got your fish down, flesh down, you could come back a couple hours later and the protein itself is completely broken down, flaking it's apart. Gonna be in the water. It's gonna be in the water, it's going to drown. So what we need to do is take a really sharp knife. What we're gonna wanna do is score this just a couple times down the skin. By doing this, when we hit the skin in the, in the pan itself, it's not gonna shrink up on us and shrivel. It'll stay nice and flat along that fish. Now, if you're not a big fan of fish skin itself, you can just peel it off uh, right before you sear it, or you could even uh, sear it off with there and there, and it'll just peel off as soon as you cook, uh, These cook it. These are about eight ounce fillets. So These are about eight ounce fillets. So wow. this is about a pound of sea bass beautiful here. Beautiful a wonderful piece of fish. We're gonna go skin side down first in our hot oil. I'm just trying to get a little bit of that oil under there. Make sure that all my skin is making contact to the pan because as it's hitting it, it's blistering, just like any skin would up against heat. Once I know that most of the skin contact is actually starting to crisp and starting to brown, I can just leave my fish alone walk away. and just walk away. That is the easiest thing to do. Now again, I do have this up on a high heat. Yeah, I'm high. gonna turn it down just a little bit because it is such a tall, big piece of protein. I don't want it to burn necessarily on the other side before I start flipping it over and we go to our garlic rosemary base anyway. Should heat my own advice, I touched the fish. doing its thing, right? Just letting it cook. So just letting it cook. Just letting it cook. We could go ahead and break down the rosemary that we're gonna use for the butter. I'm just gonna use the same plate because it is all going into the same dish itself. Uh, a little bit of sprig. I would say that's probably about two tablespoons realistically. We don't wanna go too crazy with it uh, because it is a very potent herb itself. A little couple tablespoons of butter and my garlic. See that there? Yeah, you're getting that, that pellicle yeah, that exactly. I'm talking about. Very well formed. It's very well formed. Yep. Almost ready to flip over. So what we'll do, we'll let it sit just a couple more minutes. We'll flip it over and give it about the same amount of time on the other side as we did for the skin. We can leave it skin side up and we're gonna finish it off in the oven just for about four or five minutes. We need to take it at about 155. Is that because it's so thick? That is because it is yeah. so thick. We couldn't finish it in, a, in the pan itself. We'd have to crank down the heat really low. We'd I have see. to really keep an eye on it. This way, we don't really have to. We've already got it. We know that our oven's pre-temped and it's ready to go at 350 degrees. So about how long are you putting each side down for the, um, on the skillet? Uh, I would say on the skin side, I am going more towards a four to four and a half minute. Okay. And that's also going to depend on how big the filet itself yeah. is. Smells absolutely wonderful. Looks yeah. incredible. So about like I said, on, about four, four and a half minutes on the skin side. We'll do the same thing on the other side of the skin itself. We will put skin side up into the oven because if you go skin side back down, after we've already cooked it, it's going to become soggy. We're going to lose that crisp that we want if you're going to eat it. You don't want to keep flipping it back. No, absolutely not. So as I'm working, you see me just keep touching the pan. I'm just lifting right. the oil uh -huh. to make sure that it's staying underneath, underneath the, fish, the fish and yeah. the fish isn't going to be sticking to the pan. Okay. 
So we'll go a couple head of minutes here. Now I've just killed the heat. We're probably at about our two and a half, three minute mark. Okay. Let's check that beautiful right. side there. I'm looking That's for a nice gold and brown. Like I said before, you'll leave it skin side up. And we're going to go right into the oven with it. Uh, I'd say that was in for no longer than four minutes, four and a half minutes. Really, we just needed that extra little bump to take it a little bit further because it is such a large piece of fish. But as you see, it's wonderful. Now what you're looking for in fish is for it not to flake yet. You don't want it flaking apart. The falling apart is, is, is when you've overcooked it. Okay. So we're looking for just a little bit of liquid out of it to see, see if it's clear. If that liquid's coming out clear up at the top, yeah. then our fish is, is, is ready to it's go. Ready it's to ready, go. It's ready to go. I think the big misconception is, is overcooking the fish. So once and it starts seeing, flaking, you're probably start, you're, 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 a little, you're a little bit far. So that's pulled out of the oven. We're going to throw a couple tablespoons of butter in there. So a little bit of garlic down here on the end. So we're just finishing it. It's already cooked. We don't need to cook it any further. What we're doing is just basting it, giving it a little bit of a, uh, a finishing sauce, if you will. We've got our garlic browning here in the bottom. It's starting to blister up. You can almost see that it's frying sure. itself. I just want to take a little bit of that butter oh, wow. and throw it on top there. As we're doing that too, it's also running down the sides. It's it's picking up all of the aromatics off the rosemary on the bottom of it as well. You don't want to take it too far. You don't have to do it for very long. This is in the typical chef cooking show where you see them uh -huh. basting like furiously and crazy. I think that it's all for show. That's all unnecessary. You don't need it. You just need a couple of couple spoonfuls couple of times and it's already done a trick. It's already done, it's ready to go. Uh, you had a great question earlier about how long you should let this rest. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the differences are between either a fish protein or a beef protein? This is doesn't need really any rest whatsoever. As soon as you've taken it off the heat, you can dab the oil off of it, which I'm going to do uh, right now and plate it right away. Uh, if you're going for a pork or a beef, you're going to want to allow that to rest before you start cutting into it because it's still coming up the temperature, it's still cooking. Probably a common mistake many uh, home cooks make too. Correct? I would, they I would absolutely think so. Absolutely, sure. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it a hundred times. As someone's cutting into their steak and they've got blood all over their plate, they're not really, they're impatient and. We got our wonderful skin side up. Chilean sea bass. We'll just take a little bit of that butter. Just wow. right, just right on top. And you have the honors again. Great. That is one massive filet of fish. <laughs> you got the eye roll that time. It's, it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicely done. Thanks, Chef you. Jay. So hopefully everyone at home can join us tonight. I hope you guys had as much fun as I did. It was uh, a great experience. I've learned a ton from Chef Jason tonight. Um, yeah, I, again, I hope it was very stress-free. And... It was. It was <laughs> a really wonderful time. Awesome. And uh, we'll have a toast to uh, all of our friends at Joe's Butcher Shop again for supporting such a great event. And to all of our providers and CPN, uh, thank you for all you do to take care of our patients and our community. Please keep safe and stay resilient. Bon appétit. Bon appétit.